hi, this is Kirby Summers for the Epstein Project podcast. And today I have a surprise for you. It's Greg Oliar, like caviar. And um, the way I'm going to describe him, uh, I kind of like poked around YouTube and I found something that he sort of said during a book reading. And um, so I'm going to say that he is one awesome son of a gun. This fellow can write his way out of Venezuelan jail cell. And so, Greg, can you hear me and welcome? <laughs> the, the reception in this Venezuelan jail cell is not is not so good. But yeah, no, I can I can hear you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Well, you know, I, I love you. You know, what can I say? You were the kindest man. You you wrote that incredible forward for uh, my first book on Glenn Maxwell. And, um, you know, I still read it and kind of tear up every now and then when I read what you wrote. So I, I'm eternally grateful. Well, you know, I'm not just blowing smoke, man. You know, <laughs> I call it like I see it. <laughs> oh, so. you're, you're a very kind guy. Have you been staying on top of the uh, very dramatic Glenn Maxwell antics? I mean, I'm, I'm just sort of waiting for the trial to start. And part of me is, is sort of thinking that it's never going to start. Like it's one of those things where we'll get ready for it. And then they'll say, oh, there's another delay. And then it's just going to keep going like that until we're all dead, you know, <laughs> but I, I don't know. So <laughs> it does feel like that. I mean, every now and then they think I'm going to wake up and I'm going to find out that she's left the country, you know, that she somehow they let her out of jail. But something happened, but um, it seems to be going on. He just got a haircut and uh, like a professional hair dye, which is a little contrary to what she wants. She wanted to look crazy for the uh, for that you know kind of like let me out of jail so I can go stay at a hotel so she can get into the submarine with Scott Borgerson and disappear. <laughs> yeah, I the whole thing is 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 just so strange. I think I think with Biden being president, I think is a much much less chance of her getting off at this point. I mean, but you know, things do happen. I remember, I don't know, two, three years ago, I guess, I was writing a list of um, my, in my first ill-fated attempt to do a podcast. I, it was gonna be unanswered questions about Trump stuff. And I wrote all these things like, you know, like who owns Kavanaugh and stuff about Jared Kushner. And one of the questions was, you know, what's the deal with Jeffrey Epstein? because he's the guy, obviously he was slithery, you know, he had, he had gotten in trouble that one time, but he had done so much more horrible things. And I remember thinking, well, I can save that one because that guy's nothing ever going to happen to that guy. He's clearly protected. And then not, not long after that, they arrested him and then, you know, he's dead. So th things do happen. I mean, people do get caught, you know, he, 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 as, um, you know, sometimes hopeless as it as it seems. It's like, oh, you know, I mean, Tom Barrick is is under indictment right now. And I'm sure, you know, singing like a canary. That's a good point. Um, however, this is, I think, new territory. Um, this she's only being held accountable, indicted for four victims for a very short period of time. They're only talking about the trafficking part of it. Um, they're not talking about what I think you and I see, which, I, and I just have to check back on you if you've, if you've changed your mind on this. I see, you know, uh, connections to an intelligence agency or two. Uh, that for me has not gone away. It's only intensified. Um, so that's not being brought up. And what struck me was that Judge Nathan, in one of the rulings of the last couple of weeks, uh, basically told her attorneys that they could not bring up Jeffrey Epstein's uh, non-prosecution agreement, uh, which they have been trying to bring up from the time that she was arrested on uh, June, July 2nd of 2020. And that made me feel, and I wonder if, if kind of bounced around with you in the same way, that the reason she was instructed not to bring that up was not necessarily because they're, they're not going to go for it. I, because quite frankly, in my opinion, that non-prosecution agreement, especially with one of the four victims residing in Florida, could be applied to her. 
But I think that the reason uh, Judge Nathan decided to say, hey, I'm nixing this, was to keep the door to the intelligence kind of community and remember Alex Acosta, you know, who's like the infamous line, I was told to back off that he belonged to intelligence so that that door could remain closed. I mean, how does that bounce around with you? Well, I, you know, I think you're right about all of that stuff. I think, um, you know, I, th there's a lot of, um, when we talk about intelligence agencies, I think there's a lot of, um, oh, they work for this one and oh, they work for that one and oh, they work for this and that. And I don't know, it, it's almost like with, with the term opus dei, right? There's a lot of throwing that around with regards to these Supreme Court justices. Oh, he's opus dei. Oh, he's opus. And then they can just say, no, I'm not. And I don't fucking know who's an opus dei and who's not an opus dei, right? And I'm never going to know. And it doesn't make any difference. The fact is that those guys all have a certain ideology and subscribe to it. And whether they're members of this group or not, they still serve the same function. And I feel like with Ghislaine, maybe she's... I. It, all indications are that she's involved with intelligence on some level. I mean, certainly her father was, right? And, but I feel like these, there, there's these, this class of, of people, these international folks who are very well connected and who serve as kind of the connective tissue between um, regimes and foreign intelligence services and stuff like that, like, you know, that don't normally communicate. And I think that's her function and what who she actually works for on paper. I don't think it, I don't think it matters that much. I mean, it does, but it's not. Um, I think it clouds the understanding of it, at least my understanding of it, which is that she serves a function as a sort of middleman. You know, she knows all these people and that is her utility to whatever agency, um, intelligence or otherwise that she's dealing with it at any given time. Um, Another thing that you that you brought up that I think it's important is this this non prosecution agreement, which there's a lot of there's almost a trend now, I think, where these criminals don't get in trouble or don't get um, the justice that they deserve because of these kind of legal trickery things where, OK, this person is a confidential informant. I happen to think Trump was a confidential informant for the FBI. You know, I've written about this on my site with Lincoln's Bible, um, Tinker Taylor, uh, Tinker Taylor Mobster Trump is the name of the piece. And, you know, because he's he's in the underworld, he gets involved with bad characters, then all of a sudden he, he gets in trouble legally, then all of a sudden his partner goes to jail and Trump is fine. This has yeah. happened a bunch of times. So, yep. but they, they have these agreements where they're just, it's like their crimes are, are, are wiped away. You know, people go into witness protection and then continue to do crimes, uh, which defeats the purpose of witness protection. And of course, the ultimate example is the presidential pardons that Trump gave to like Paul Manafort and Mike Flynn and Roger Stone. And, um, you know, these guys and Bannon, these guys are now criming. I mean, they're criming because they got these pardons. And it's it's such a mockery of the justice system that these things honestly even exist. But, you know, what do I know? I'm not a lawyer. You know, he almost pardoned Ghislaine, um, huh. and he was talked out of it because I forget who advised him and basically said, don't do it, because he really was going to do it. He was worried. He was asking questions. Is she talking about me? Remember, he wished her well. Yeah. He wanted her on his good side. But um, he basically he didn't pardon her, it's my understanding, because then if she had gotten the pardon on the federal level, because the case that we have now is on the federal level and it begins November 29th. So just nine days from today, yay. Um, if, if things go according to plan. Yeah. Um, it's because then if, uh, then it would open her up to um, like on the, on the, on the other levels, the levels below, you know, the, the individual state levels and all of that. And it would have perhaps created a bigger um, scandal than it already was. And he decided not to do it because he'd already, you know, he's implicated between, while we have heard the names Bill Clinton and Donald Trump, and we hear Prince Andrew, and we hear even George, George Bush uh, connected to Jeffrey Epstein, along with the list of very notable people who run our world. 
um, he was friends with Donald Trump for a very long time. While I don't believe he was necessarily, quote, friends with Clinton, I think that was a different kind of relationship. But with Trump, I mean, wouldn't you agree that he was like, they were pals, they partied together, you know, they, they just, they were just, they were friends for a long time. The whole thing with Trump kind of trying to re reimagine his friendship or his relationship with Epstein was laughable. I mean, there's, there's too much footage, just even footage that we were, that were able to see. I mean, my guess is that at, certainly as it pertains to Glenn, um, I don't think Trump had all that much to do with her. Um, this is just, I'm totally speculating here. And that I think other people had a lot more to do with her and were a lot closer. So he might have thought, if I do this part and people might look cl more closely at my involvement, and there's no reason for them to, because I don't even, I didn't even really do anything, um, certainly, you know, illegal with her. Um, I may be wrong. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, with the Epstein thing, I think the Trump Epstein relationship certainly was different than the ones that he forged with other people, because also, um, you know, if you're, I was talking, um, with, uh, Nina Burley, who's going to be on my podcast in a couple of weeks. Uh, and she was saying that, um, you know, if you're on a plane with Bill Clinton or Prince Andrew, you can land all these crazy places in that plane that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to land. So not only was, was Epstein cultivating those people because they were powerful, they also had, you know, logistical utility. They could be exploited in, in just in a simple way like that. Like, hey, Prince Andrew's on the plane, therefore we can land at this Air Force base or whatever. If it was just him, he wouldn't be able to do that. So, you know, I think that's interesting too. I think Epstein probably approached it in a different way. Um, because when those guys were palling around, I don't really think anyone thought that Trump was going to be president, for God's sake. Even Epstein, I don't think really would have imagined that. Well, I, I, I beg to differ. And the reason I do is because in 1989, we've all seen a photograph of Robert Maxwell on the Lady Galen after he purchased the Daily Mail. I'm sorry, the Daily News in New York City. And it, I think I have uh, some of this information in a couple of my books and is specifically, I think I have it in Glenn Maxwell, an unauthorized biography. Donald Trump was on the yacht. Uh, he was in the process of getting a divorce from Ivana, um, who had already become a very close friend of Glenn. Um, John Tower was there and Tower is the guy who opened up the Ronald Reagan White House for Robert Maxwell and, and paved the way for him to get into Sandia Laboratories where he kind of like, you know, sold them a compromised version of a promise. Um, my point being that the Trump's family relationship with the, the Maxwell family preceded uh, Jeffrey Epstein's involvement with Galen. Um, so, it, and at the and if you if you think about it, and at the time it was said that they had a an interesting rivalry. They both liked to wear red, you know, red ties. Robert wore a bow tie. Um, Donald wore a straight tie. However, Robert Maxwell in 1989 was aware of uh, Donald Trump's desire to become president, and he had been playing. Trump, you know, like I know Trump through my own situation over here and through my own past and, you know, the Rickless's being in his building and taping him and doing all kinds of things. But Trump had played with the idea of becoming president for decades. I think at one point he was in his early 40s and he he made a couple of statements to a couple of people. I'm too young. I'll have to wait a little bit longer. But I think the idea that he was going to run was many people knew about it, including the Maxwells. Uh, Robert Maxwell certainly knew about that. And, and you know, he although his friendship began because they shared attorneys and PR people with, let's say, Fred Trump and then later Donald. Um, but no one, I think, believed he would win. You know, running is one thing. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I mean. Yeah. I mean. Like he, 
Trump started talking about running for president when he returned from his trip to the Soviet Union, like almost immediately after he came back that first trip. Um, that's when he started talking about it. And, you know, he had forays. Roger Stone was running stuff for him. He went to New Hampshire. I forget what year this was. I, I, I don't want to get it wrong. If it was 88 or 92, I can't remember. He was in, uh, might have been earlier than that. He was up in New Hampshire, you know, which is kind of the place where you go, where you're trying to make a name for yourself in these things. Gave a couple policy speeches and then, and then shut it down when he realized that it was just, you know, not fun, waste of time, whatever. But yeah, like, I, you know, it's one thing to run for president. I mean, you know, Je Jesse the Body Ventura ran for president, you know. That's doesn't, true. I forgot all about that. Doesn't mean he's going to win. So, um, you know, I, I would think that if I'm Epstein, um, and you're looking at these people in a very transactional way, which I think is always how he looked at people. Like, what what is this guy's talent? What can they do for me? How can I exploit this person for what purpose? Um, certainly there were uses for Trump, but I don't think that even, that anybody would have been like, oh, this guy's going to be president someday. I, I just don't think anybody- well, you're right. I think that. even when he ran, no one believed that he yeah. was going to be president. One of my friends wrote the Franklin scandal. I, you may have heard of him. His name is Nick Bryant. Um, what he found of interest and in a few other people that I know um, who are studying this and studying other child trafficking rings is that it was brought to everyone's attention or at least the mainstream media who were covering the 2016 election that you know, here we have two candidates that will have connections to Jeffrey Epstein, and mainstream media was radio silent on this. And 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 you know, the way from my perspective, I'm like, yeah, because that is a, a function of our government by blackmail. That's that's the way we have functioned for decades and decades. No matter if there's a Republican or a Democrat in the in the House. That's just the way we we operate, and and that's why mainstream media has kind of just focused on a certain aspect of this. They kind of thought we would just disappear; us kids would go away when Jeffrey Epstein was killed, murdered, died, suicided, whatever. And and they're hoping the same now with the with the Maxwell trial. I mean, I I don't know. I just I just think that. Um, Mainstream media is no longer necessarily an arm that that can be where they where where intelligence agencies need to intercept. I think they pretty much own them now. You know, like in the nineteen uh, seventy five during the Church Committee hearings, uh, when Sig uh, Miggleton, who was the chairman of CBS and the CEO when he was questioned about the CIA's role with CBS, he, he said, uh, you know, I joined CBS in 1950 something, it could have been the mid fifties. And by the time I joined, we already had a working relationship with the CIA. But in today's media, I see that there's no longer the need for that middleman that pretty much we get propaganda from mainstream media and from each other. Like, you know, I get the news from you. <laughs> you maybe get the news from me for something. Mm -hmm. But we, just, we have this we have this subset of people like us getting the news from each other that we can't get from the sources that are being paid and that have these nice cush 401k that, you know, they have all of the pension plans. Like we have nothing. We have just us. We have nothing. I mean, I want to be careful not to, it's not this monolithic thing though. Like I, you know, it, it's, it's so complicated because one of the things about the media is, I mean, and you're right, the mainstream media, especially the TV media sucks. It's, it, it, it's, it's mind boggling how bad it is. Like this last week, there's so much going on in the news, right? This is like a historic time in the news. You've got Biden with this, this enormous uh, piece of legislation that's like, you know, one of the first things like that that's happened in, in, in my lifetime, right? And uh, um, all the media wants to talk about is like Chris Christie. Yeah. Why? You know, is it, I, I don't know if it's because the PR team that he hired wants to give him, I, I, I don't understand 
the mechanism behind it. But what we have, what I've seen is, you know, we have really good journalists. We have really good reporters. We have really good journalism being done and good stories being written. I mean, most of what I know about anything comes from, you know, mainstream journalism. You know, the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, the, these papers broke big stories consistently for the last five, six years, right? And before that too, but we're just talking about the Trump period. You know, all, all of the meetings with the Russians and all of the stuff with, um, remember Suzanne Craig at, at, at the New York Times Magazine had that big expose on the Fred Trump, Donald Trump, like tax fraud stuff. And, um, you know, it, 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 Catherine Eban at Vanity Fair wrote the pieces about Jared Kushner and how he bungled intentionally the, the pandemic response. Like this is important journalistic work, but it stops at a certain level. It's like the media decides or somebody up high decides we're going to talk more about this, but not that. And, you know, we have three quarters of a million Americans dead in this country because of COVID. And it's like, everybody's fucking forgotten about it. Like we have collective amnesia. I mean, why are we not talking about that? Like all the time? I mean, it's something that affects everybody, not only in the country, but in the world. And yet, you know, not that the media isn't reporting on it, but just the way they're doing it is sort of both sidesing everything instead of being like, hey, this is the fucking, th these are the facts. This is what we need to do. And why are we not holding the people responsible for exacerbating this thing? Because they sabotage the response. Why are we not holding Trump and Pence and Jared Kushner responsible for that? I don't know. You know, if I was running a media outlet, I would be on that stuff because it's important. I mean, nothing has affected more people than the pandemic in, in recent agree. memory. Yeah. But it's really interesting because if you, you you're not really even allowed uh if you have a YouTube channel to talk about the C word, because if you do, you are deplatformed, which is really bizarre. So, you know, but then, you know, we have, we have uh, journalists or reporters or whatever you want to call them. Someone like Daphne Barak, who is the cousin of the former prime minister of Israel, Ehud Barak, who was of course very connected to Jeffrey Epstein. And then we have Carbine 911, which is basically today, Greg, our 911 system in the United States, so you can only imagine the horrors that that entails, who just wrote a Daily Mail article uh, uh, where she doesn't reveal the fact that she has been Glenn Maxwell's friend of, you know, 30 some odd years, but she allows Glenn Maxwell to just grieve you know, just, just, just try to make an, a, like a pity play, right? Just get... Mm -hmm garner public sympathy i oh i i can't shower because the guards are watching me and now i want to remind you that let's say not only did glenn have naked pictures of herself in every one of, of jeffrey epstein's homes but in new mexico one of the um people who did maintenance for epstein for about 10 years spoke to i forget what what uh, main what media but one of these you know tabloidish kind of things and he said that as he was walking down into the basement level um there was a like life-size six foot six painting of Glenn Maxwell stark naked sitting on this chair spread eagle literally holding a dagger now we're supposed to believe that glenn maxwell someone who is known to just love to be naked and who yeah. probably you know possibly had more lovers than anybody on the planet i'm gonna be nice with that word lover i don't necessarily mean it in that way but i'm gonna be kind you know i don't have to be bitchy every day but that we're suddenly she's she's oh she's so modest she can't take a shower these are female guards watching so she's i mean that so that it it, it, it was in, insulting to me when i realize i look at the name barack and i'm like wait a minute i have to see who this daffy person is i go to her twitter and there are pictures of her from being the first person to interview Glenn Maxwell in 1992 when she arrived in New York in Central Park. Another interview was her and her mother in at the Trump Plaza, you know, when Trump still owned it. And now, you know, working for 
Jordy Gregg, who was just demoted, another guy mm -hmm. hit. I mean, like, how many people are going to have to step down from their positions as a result of Glenn Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein? So I don't know. I mean, like, the only people who are really covering the story are, let's say, the Daily Mail, which we can't trust, because I don't really see American papers covering the story, unless you've seen them and I, I've just missed it. I think once the trial starts, it'll be they'll be covering it um, because then there's, you know, sort of nuts and bolts stuff to write about. And you've seen I know weren't the sisters just on some one of the shows, you know, in yeah. soft lighting, trying to trust wash the whole, you know, um, I think it was CBS with uh, Gail King. I mean, you know, and it's, I don't know, like I get that they're trying to do that, but yeah, I, I the, the, the both sides of the media is really something it, it's, it's, um, you know, it, it's taken to its extreme and, the, the way that, and I get it, they want to be fair. Like it makes sense. Okay. If, if somebody comes onto the show and says, so-and-so is a jerk because they did this, it makes sense to call so-and-so and get a comment. And, you know, that that's fine. That's good journalism, but something like, um, you know, COVID vaccines or uh, the insurrection or, you know, how many people are dead because of this thing Trump did, uh, or, or the encroaching autocracy of, of the Republican Party, which is couldn't be more obvious, and I don't think is is even deniable at this point. Um, the fact that they continue to both sides that, as if the Republican Party at this point is a is like it was 25 years ago, and is a normal functioning, you know, conservative party, rather than just something that exists to seize power, obstruct, and deny people the right to vote. And, and save money for rich. I don't know what else the, the platform is anymore. I mean, the Republican governors in Texas and Florida and Mississippi and elsewhere are, you know, they have, they have uh, um, policies that are designed to kill as many of their constituents as possible. I mean, the, the, the most basic thing that, that you're supposed to do as a, as, a, as a member of the executive branch of government is protect the people. So I don't understand how you know, a guy like Ron DeSantis or, you know, and they want that the, the media try so hard to make those guys look good. And on the flip side, to, to, to make Biden and Kamala Harris look bad. It's like they can't, they, they're tripping over themselves to make Biden look terrible and like he's out of touch and he hasn't done anything. And it's like, dude, we were all like st stuck in our houses like a year ago. And Trump fucked this up and Biden came over. And now we all have everybody that's had a vaccine that wants a vaccine has one. That's not nothing apart from everything else. I mean, did we just forget about this? I don't know. It just it, it, it boggles the mind. It really does. What do you think about um, his choice for um, secretary of state in Antony Blinken with a direct connection to Glenn Maxwell? It is kind of it, it, it is kind of interesting that that. That that's the case. Now I have issues with him, not because of that. I don't. I don't like to. Um, and, and the connection I think is his stepdad was good friends with Robert Maxwell, right? Is that what it is? Blinken's stepdad. Yeah, was a very good friends. He was his attorney. He yeah. was um, his advisor. He was also when we go back to the 1960s. Now this French-born attorney becomes the um, advisor to John F. Kennedy in the 1960s. There is this connection between the Kennedys and the Maxwells that no one has really discussed that I will be going into in my in my sequel, Glenn Maxwell Blackmail. Uh, the, 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 the Maxwell family and Prince Andrew have been trolling me to death because of my books. They, they, they wait till I get this one out because it's, they're really going to be upset. Um, but yeah, no, I so that so that and so that he is the stepson of Samuel Pissar. Leah Pissar was actually in a very top level position in, in a Bill Clinton's office. And Anthony Blinken has been working in the White House uh, since his sister Leah Pissar worked for Clinton. And so, you know, at some point to look beneath the layer of, let's say, this is the this was a blackmail operation, maybe connected to intelligence, so on and so forth. I think at some level, we have to open our eyes and say, well, what were the ramifications? 
when I look at this, the ramifications and, and the, and the, uh, what's the end result? What, what did they do it for? Um, is to put people in power. So one of the people that I see as a direct result that came out of the, let's say the machine that the Epstein Maxwell machine would be, let's say an Antony Blinken being selected secretary of state along with the, many other people that I see, you know, I'm even concerned and thinking, oh, Boris Johnson, we just heard that, you know, Glenn Maxwell in Oxford they were buddies and you know she had her booted leg on his booted foot on his leg whenever i've had my booted foot on somebody's leg i've just had you know i've been intimate with the guy <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's like so how, who's my my thing is it's like there are people in positions of power i believe as a direct result of this blackmail ring that that's the way i perceive it and so yeah the anthony blinken uh, connection i think i think does play a role you know there are four positions that have I mean, you know yeah go ahead i j- just to push back on it a little bit and, and give benefit of the doubt like it is very very eye-opening and and it's not deniable that his stepdad and maxwell really were they did have the relationship that doesn't mean that he's bad or he's in on it or he's anything necessarily right we have to we have to say that because we don't know i don't know uh, what that means. I don't know if, you know, my, my kids don't, don't know what I'm doing most, most of the time. I didn't know what my dad was doing most of the time. And, uh, you know, just because that thing is there on paper doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything more to it than that. I think we have to say that. I will say, I don't, I, I don't love him. I don't think he's doing a very good job, certainly with Ukraine and Russia and that stuff, which for me is the most important thing. I don't think um, they've been hard enough on Russia and really gone after them, at least on the surface in the way that I hoped they would. Um, you know, I, I, maybe they're starting to now in, in better ways, but I, I, I haven't been wildly thrilled with him just from a performance standpoint, um, not from any other, you know, th- thing like that. Uh, I think between him and Merrick Garland, eh, I don't know. They, I, 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 don't, I don't think they were too, they, they were the greatest choices, but you know, well, it remains to be seen. Um, you know, it used to be that we had these super PACs that went after um, changing the law, putting certain people in office, getting rid of others, so on and so forth. To me, it seems like it, the blackmail has kind of taken over that role. So we won't know the truth about anyone. You know, no one's going to come out and say Jeffrey Epstein was a spy. Here's a piece of paper. Glenn Maxwell was a spy. Here's a, here's a paper. Or even uh, about Robert Maxwell and the person who outed Robert Maxwell was Seymour Hirsch. I have a lot of respect for Seymour Hirsch. Um, I, you know, I think he did his due diligence. Uh, ultimately, uh, the, the lawsuit was dropped and he was given an apology. So, you know, I think that we're okay to say that Robert Maxwell was a spy. D- and then, you know, you have to start wondering what, you know, his connections are the connections that Glenn Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein used. So, it, I, you know, I, I, the whole thing is just such mush, but okay, let me just, Prince Andrew, what, what do you think is going to happen with, with, with the royal uh, clown? Oh my um, God. I, I want to, wait, before we go to Prince Andrew, I want to stay in, in Britain. Boris Johnson is so, he he has so many <laughs> weird connections to Russia and has done so much bad shit with Brexit and everything. Brexit is just a Russian op. It's it's the it, I think that the Russians launched Brexit at Great Britain and they launched Trump in the United States and it was you know two sides of the same two two you know phases of the same op designed to you know break up the 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 western alliances and sow discontent and create chaos and weaken uh us and it worked. And Boris Johnson was a major player in that. And I don't think that's deniable. He, he was, you know, one of the one of the faces of uh, the leave movement. He, you know, there was lots of, of falsehoods bandied about about it. And, you know, he's got connections with these with with these ex KGB ex in quotes KGB guy. Um, so to, to, I and then I, there was that story where 
they were refurbishing, um, you know, the offices of the prime minister and this, this hired this Russian firm to go in there and do that. Uh, and, and Britain is a place where Russian assassins just go there and kill people without worrying about consequences, you know, so it's really bad. He's bad. Aside from the, I didn't, I, I missed that about <laughs> the, really? Delane's boot on his on his I'll tell uh, you what was funny is that it's his own sister who wrote this for um let's see she wrote it for the spectator just a few days ago she it's right her name is Rachel Johnson she's Boris Johnson's younger sister and she's and she's almost writing something to try to garner sympathy again for Glenn Maxwell mm -hmm. but you know, maybe she, you know, she just didn't understand that. And so she writes, um, it's hard not to feel a bat, bat squeak of pity for Galen Maxwell, 500 days and counting in solitary confinement. I intersected briefly with her at Oxford. As a fresher, I wandered into uh, the school one day in search of its subsidized breakfast granola and Nescafe ordering and found a shiny, I don't know what she meant, you know, the British use really weird terms as far as I'm concerned, with naughty eyes holding court, astride a table, a high heeled boot resting on my brother Boris's thigh. And so, so it's like, hello. I mean, so I'm sure Boris Johnson was just mortified to see that his sister has just said that, you know, this happened. Because frankly, while I've been doing my research for the past two years for my books, I had found uh, rumors, not, nothing I could substantiate, nothing uh, about her and Boris Johnson. So I never wrote anything about it. I didn't even look into Johnson at all. I kind of thought, you know, just because he's he's in Britain, whatever, just, but he is the prime minister of, like, come on, he's an important guy. And suddenly, you know, he's playing hanky-panky with, with Galen and his little sister just kind of said this. And there were all these rumors that no one could like, they weren't going away, but whenever you went to one of these sites that are supposed to tell you, is this the truth? Is, is it not the truth? I forget what that site is, but it was kind of like decided that that was not a trustworthy place to go. Oh, mm -hmm. false. That rumor is false, false, false. It's like, well, maybe there's something to this. Um, I don't know. She's just too connected to all of these powerful people for her for her not to be intelligent. I mean, she's certainly connected, you know, <laughs> she's she's certainly <laughs> connected. I mean, that's for sure. Um, OK, so Prince Andrew, you wanted to talk about Prince Andrew. Uh, I don't think there's any chance in hell that they get him to, to testify at this thing. Um, I may be wrong. I just I don't see the queen allowing it. And, you know, he's, there's people that are protected and there's really people that are protected, right? I mean, we talk about Epstein being protected according to, what's his name, Alex, and uh, stuff like that, and other people that seem to be protected. But, you know, the, the son of the Queen of England is, is somebody that is not going to be treated like every Tom, Dick, and Harry on the street. That's just, you know, it, it's not right, but it's fact. So... I don't know that anything's going to come out of that in terms of his involvement. I think it's absolutely a black eye on the royal family, which, it, you know, it's not like the royal family is this great group of uh, do-gooders or anything. You know, we, we could talk about that, too, if you want. Oh, um, my God, the Mountbatten and, and his preference for little boys from India. It's like it's this is a, a mul the, 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 the royal family is just and then Charles with his friendship with Jimmy Savile. Uh, you know, the, these, but you're, you're right. They, they get away with it, don't they? Well, the whole thing, you know, with the, with the Isle of Jersey, if you, if you go back and, and listen to my podcast with Stuart Sivray, who was um, a Senator there and then got kind of railroaded out of the job because he was in charge of um, basically CPS, like child protective services, whatever they call it in the UK. He was in charge of that for Jersey, and he kept getting complaints from his constituents. Oh, this these people, you know, this orphanage is bad, and they're doing these bad things, and da da da. And he looked into it and determined, oh, holy shit, there's something. This is terrible. There's something going on here. And every time he tried to um, shine a light on it, or have it properly investigated, or God forbid, you know, 
uh, indict anybody that was responsible for it. It was just covered up and covered up and covered up. And, you know, to the point where it's obvious cover up. But the thing about Jersey is that, first of all, it's a tax haven. It's one of the most preeminent tax havens in the world, which means that money flows there from questionable sources, whether it is uh, rich libertarian types who are just trying to, you know, avoid taxation in their home countries, whether it's, um, you know, mobsters and people like that, uh, and, and or oligarchs who are taking the money out of their home countries and, you know, want it somewhere safe, or, uh, you know, potentates and these dictator types who are, you know, boosting money from the coffers of the, the treasuries where they live, all of that money mixed together and, and flows to Jersey. And for, so it's a tax haven, but it's also, it's not, it's part of, it's not part of the United Kingdom. It's, it's, it's called a crown dependency, which means that essentially it is a monarchy. It's still a place where the queen literally holds sway, right? So the judiciary and the legislature, it's all controlled. The prime minister of Jersey, I think it's, it's not the prime minister. I think he's called the, uh, the bailiff. Um, and the courts are all controlled by these same forces. And so nothing gets done without the consent of the royal family and the crown. And if the crown you know, hints that they want something done one way, it's going to get done that way. And the people that do the job are going to be rewarded with titles and everything else. And that's how it works. And Prince Andrew's finger, you know, he, he was kind of, as I understand it, um, instrumental in, in doing trade deals and stuff with Jersey. So again, it all goes back to the child sex stuff because there was this huge scandal there, um, you know, that's now pretty well documented. Uh, you know, Leah McGrath Goodman did a, a big piece on it in um, Institutional Investor. There's, there was a documentary about it on the BBC. So th that place is, you know, it's very, very difficult to explain that the queen didn't know what was going on there. And if she didn't know, the sons must have known. They had to have known. So, you know, that Prin Prince Andrew's coming out of that also, aside from the Epstein stuff which is, you know, it's, it's its own child sex stuff that's right. an, an abuse, you know, of orphans right. um, that's really, really bad. So this guy is not a great guy. <laughs> He's really kind of a scummy guy. And, you know, is he going to be friends with Epstein? Of course he is. Epstein's going to cultivate him for, you know, any number of reasons. He's right. powerful. He's connected. He, he allows for diplomatic immunity and the plane to go hither and yon. Um, he gets you access to all this stuff. And, you know, I, I think that they probably were actually really good friends in real life. I think they probably, maybe they probably really did like each other. You know, who knows? It's, it's a mess though, that guy, he's really not a good, good man. He's not. I, I, even the guards that have um, sort of worked for him and the Royal family at Buckingham Palace, those that have retired have come out with their tell all saying mm. he's so nasty you know he just calls you really bad names and he uses the f bomb all day and so for him to show up and say that he, you know he's a gentleman or he's had none of that um but this is not you know a lot of people think that what's going on with andrew because there is no uh federal investigation n not by the United States government and certainly not by the United Kingdom into Prince Andrew. This is a, a civil lawsuit that was brought against him by Virginia Giuffray. Virginia Giuffray brought a civil lawsuit against Glenn Maxwell in 2015, which was settled in 2017. Uh, he responded to this initially by saying, I wasn't served, even though, you know, there were photos of, of serve, service everywhere. You know, the attorney sent service to all the attorneys that were connected to Prince Andrew and sent it to Bucky, just sent it. But, you know, I wasn't served. And then finally, they allowed uh, the court to, you know, send service again. An attorney who represents Army Hammer, who's been alleged to, you know, be like uh, Hannibal Lecter and, you know, all the, and they're just the attorneys they use also is they're, they're, they're worth going and looking at who they, who they represent because these people also are, they tend to go to familiar attorneys who handle very 
seedy characters. I'm just going to call it, call it that. Um, but then his attorney showed up in court and said, um, so in, that that they're going to be able to um, basically have this, uh, you know, have the judge toss this. Um, but and and based on some advice he got from Alan Dershowitz, which is that there's an agreement that Virginia signed with Jeffrey Epstein, I believe in 2009, where, and this was something that the government made Epstein do. And it's really interesting when we see also that the attorneys that were put in charge of, let's say the Epstein fund compensation fund for victims, I don't know the exact wording of it, but there's a fund that was set up that they also did the same funds for they handled the fund for 9-11 they handled this fund for the 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 grown men who had been victims of the archdiocese the catholic church so it's fascinating to watch who gets put in charge of what because it shows that i think the importance in the eyes of our government at least um but Virginia signed away when you, you you accept a certain amount of money because that is how the law works. If you if you uh, if it's a civil lawsuit, our court system has decided that in a civil lawsuit, it's a monetary damage. They don't send people to jail on a monetary damage on a civil damage. You pay a certain damage that's decided by the court and or decided uh, amongst the parties and it's a settlement. Um, so she signed something like that with Jeffrey Epstein in 2009. And, and that agreement had a, a paragraph or sentence or two or something like that, that basically said that by accepting this agreement, Virginia uh, will not hold accountable either his attorneys, his friends, his employees, his business associates, no one. So Prince Andrew is claiming through his attorneys that that makes it that he can walk away from this. And so he's been given, I believe he's supposed to show up in court, not well, he, he can, you know, have just his attorney show up in court. He's not going to come to New York, but he they're scheduled to do this, I believe, in on May 13th of 2022 which is very, very fast. You know, our courts are overcrowded and we have a lot of cases. So for him to have been given this, this court date. Um, but I think, you know, sadly, everyone is saying, oh, well, you know, let's hold Prince Andrew accountable. I think you have a point. Uh, you know, they're gonna use anything and this seems very plausible that they're gonna say, oh, well, you know, Jeffrey Epstein's previous arrangement with, with um, with Virginia means that he can walk too. So I I don't have a lot of hope for it, although, you know, fingers crossed, right? Well, I mean, the one thing we have to say, you know, so we don't spiral into doom and gloom. I mean, I think there was a point not long ago when something like this would just have been covered up and that would be the end of it, you know? Um, and we're not seeing that now. We are seeing victims coming together and finding representation and having their their day in court. And there's a lot of hurdles and obstacles along the way, as you know. But at least the, I feel like some progress is being made on a in a cosmic sort of way, you know, where some of some attempt and, and success at fighting the power and exposing the bad guys and making it so that, you know, this this abhorrent behavior isn't just something that people can get away with and never think about again it is something now that hey you've done these horrible things maybe it's you're gonna have to you know at least show up in court one day and talk about it or you're gonna have to pay restitution you're gonna have to you know sign this document and give this these people money or whatever and i that's not that doesn't change what happened or or go back in time and erase um the trauma but it's better than where we were i think so you know, it, you you mentioned the, the case with the, with the archdiocese. That was another. I mean, the Catholic Church. You know, I mean, God knows how long that's been going on in the church. Yeah. Um, my 
my father-in-law grew up in a, a small town in the upper peninsula. And that, that place was just rampant with, with, with priests who would molest kids. And they, one of them would come in and then he would leave and somebody else would go there. And I was like, I think they just sent people there as a punishment. You know, they, when they caught them doing this in Boston or New York, they sent them to this podunk in, in the upper peninsula. Uh, and that's where they, you know, to, a, 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 as punishment. Um, but it didn't mean that they couldn't stop being predators. Um, I mean, it took, that was very recent that that happened, but it did happen. And now when people uh, make accusations, I think they're believed or they're much more likely to be believed than ever before. And, you know, maybe this, maybe this generation, um, the, the battle that's being waged now by, by this generation, I guess by our generation, will make it so that future generations won't won't have quite as much uh, obstacles in their way, you know, to achieving justice. At least that's what I hope. I think you you, you make a valid point. It's it, the fact that victims are being heard. Um, it's a, it's a lot different, let's say, than what happened with the Franklin child abuse scandal of the Ronald Reagan era, where if you go to Wikipedia, it says it was a hoax where one of the victims was thrown into jail because she did not recant, where the other victims were murdered and nothing happened. And it's still considered a hoax, even though, you know, there are newspaper accounts of the teenage boys visiting the White House at midnight. It's still considered a hoax. And and, and, and so we are at a different time, I think, primarily because we have social media. <laughs> yeah. It's helping, right? I think if we didn't have social media, do you, I mean, I don't think we would be here. I mean, that's the thing, the internet. I mean, there's a lot of really bad things about social media, you know, lots of bad things. Yes. Facebook <laughs> is an insidious, awful thing, but absolutely, you know, it, it enables people to get to connect and to disseminate information and, you know, how many times you go on Twitter and see, here's a video of this thing that happened. Here's a video of that thing that happened. I mean, without the phones everywhere also, and the ability to, um, to document things that are happening in real time. I mean, if you look, think about the Kennedy assassination, which is still, you know, all these years later, the subject of so much um, debate and conspiratorial uh, stuff. But, you know, that Zabruder happened to be there with that camera. If he wasn't there, that would have been it. We would have no footage of that at all. That's and true. Now, if something like that happened, I mean, it would just be everywhere. All the, you know, we'd have a, a thousands yeah, of different true. of different versions of, of it um, to look at. I mean, even 9-11, which is, you know, relatively recent, yeah. people didn't have phones like they do now. You know, they couldn't take these these videos like they can now. So even if something like that happened again, the way that we perceived it would be so much different. Um, you know, there's these things when when Teddy Roosevelt was running for president, I think the second time he um, he got shot while he was giving a speech and he it was a long speech and he had the um, he had it in his pocket. And I think it was I guess the gun was not very good. So the bullet got lodged. Th went through the speech and it, it it was a flesh wound so he was bleeding but he was fine and then he gave the speech he finished the fucking speech right he and he said no it takes more than that to kill this bull moose and that's why the bull moose party got its name could you imagine if that happened today a guy gets yeah. up the president gets and he just was like fuck you and he finishes this i, I, I twitter would melt down with that sure. it would be the most <laughs> amazing thing ever um and that's, you know, we don't have any footage of that. We just, we just have people that, the, you know, the words of people who were there. And, uh, you know, same with the Lincoln assassination and all this stuff. So, yeah, the social media and, and the, 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 the fact that all of us now are basically cameramen on the ground um, makes a huge difference. Um, you know, I, I, and generally for the good. And all of this stuff can be subverted, of course, and, and used and... and um, you know, uh, surveilled and stuff like that, Lord knows. But I think for the most part, it does help. It does help to have, you know, strength in numbers.
No, I agree. I agree. I, I, I won't keep you too long because this is the beginning of our holiday week, theoretically. Happy Thanksgiving, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> you too. You too. Thank you. Thank you. But I do, I do want to know how you feel. Um, what do you think the outcome will be with Galen? I'm just curious to hear your thoughts because you are, you have really good gut instinct. You know, you even if you don't follow something on a regular basis, the way that you approach things, you do it. Um, you seem to have like these tentacles that are like go deep into the ground. That's how I see you. You're so <laughs> rooted into certain things that I, I, I don't see many people who are on your level uh, or who could have this capacity to do that. So I am very, very curious how you think this Glenn Maxwell thing will play out. Yeah. Well, thank you for, thank you for that compliment. I, I appreciate it. Um, I, the short answer is I have no idea. I mean, it, this is something where any outcome, not, no outcome would surprise me. Like, I don't think there's anything that could happen in that trial that would truly surprise me. I wouldn't be surprised if she got off. I wouldn't be surprised if there was never any trial. I wouldn't be surprised if she was set free. I wouldn't be surprised if she went to jail. Nothing. There, there's just, there isn't anything that would surprise me. If I had to guess, and again, I, I'm not a lawyer. I have no idea. I think this is a very specific case about something very specific. And my guess is they'll they'll keep it focused in a very um, tight way around just what she's being charged for, not bring in anything else. And, you know, that's what it'll be. And maybe I don't think she'll get a long sentence. I think they'll give her time served or whatever. And 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 then that'll be it. That, that would be my guess, you know, that pe people will be happy that she got convicted, but annoyed that she didn't get enough jail time, like something like that would be my guess. But again, I. There is nothing that would surprise me about this. Zero. Regrettably, uh, I have to agree with you. <laughs> well, listen, thank you for joining me today. Um, this was a very, very good chat. I'm going to actually post it in about 10 minutes because I want everyone to listen. Um, so thank you for this. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I please, people, like the video. Like the video, subscribe, and leave your comments below. And I'm sure... Greg and I will be looking at that. Okay, well, thank you for this and um, you have a good day. Bye-bye.